Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com. Today we're going to be going over a famous game from 2006 between Not, the current chess champion, and Sergey K. At this time, he was a 16 year old. He's a grandmaster, a fantastic grandmaster at that. Um, he's played some of the most exciting games I've seen in recent history. But I've been asked a lot to make more videos on famous games, so I thought, why not? make famous games that are related to the latest in-depth analysis that I've done on chess openings. If you've seen the last video, um, the Nightdorf defense, this is what that is based on. So a famous game dealing with the line that we just talked about. If you have not watched that video, I definitely recommend watching it. It does have a lot of the ideas and the concepts that both sides are going to be focused on. So if you don't have a lot of background, it'll make more sense in the video if you watch that one first. Um, but we will go ahead and get into it. Again, this is Anon playing the black pieces and Sergi K, the 16-year-old at the time, playing the white pieces. So like I said before, this is the Ninth Dwarf Defense. So again, be familiar with that. But it starts out with Pawn E4, Pawn C5, the Sicilian, Knight F3, Pawn 2 D6, Pawn D4, Exchange on D4, Knight F6, Knight C3, and then Knight or excuse me, pawn to a6. This is the knight dwarf defense right here. Trying to block off this b5 square from an attack from not only this knight here, this knight here on c3, but also the bishop coming down to b5. Later on, black can look to push forward with his pawn to b5. He does have this semi-open c file. If he ever wants to bring his rook or other pieces to attack on this semi-open c file, he also can get his light square bishop to the game on b7 once he pushes forward with this b5 pawn. From here, white's going to elect for the e3, bishop to e3. Again, if you've watched the, the Night Door Defense video, you know this is the English attack. This is the more common line that you'll see nowadays. Uh, previously, uh, before maybe like the 1990s, a lot of times you would see bishop to g5. This was the main line. Typically nowadays, you will see bishop to e3. Still very aggressive. Again, we are in the Sicilian, so pretty much anything you see is going to be uh, very, very aggressive. But this has kind of been more analyzed over the, the current years as, as the main line. So from here, black really has two different options. He can always bring his pawn to e6, or he can bring his pawn to e5. Um, Anon elects for the e5, which immediately is going to push this knight back here on d4, uh, back here to b3. Now anytime you do see this pawn coming to e5, typically the bishop next is going to come to e6. Again, simple development move, trying to get the bishop, the light score bishop, and this knight here on b8 out of the way. So the rook can really get involved if he wants to come to c8. He can't always come to b8 and start this push of b5, um, but really wants to just start you know, developing his pieces. He's eventually going to get his dark square bishop involved into the game, castle on the king side. Uh, typically, white's going to look to castle on the queen side, and then there's going to be fireworks. Black's really going to try to attack the queen side, and white's going to attack the king side. From here, white continues with pawn to f3. Uh, th this kind of serves two purposes. One minor, it does protect this pawn here on e4, but more importantly, white really wants to stop the, the knight coming to g4. If you've seen any other of the other Nidorf defense videos or the Sicilian videos, you know this can kind of be a pain in the rear for white um, as black just kind of harasses the bishop there on e3. So that's why the pawn comes to f3. This also signals that white is definitely going to be castling on the queen side. Uh, typically, if you are going to castle on the king side, you are either going to start pushing this forward to open up the f file for your rook, or you're not going to move this f pawn as well at all um, because this long diagonal does become a huge weakness for you. While you're watching this video, keep two things in the back of your head. For the first 10 moves, we're actually just doing simple development moves in the Sicilian defense. Actually, up until the 23rd move, which is kind of interesting to think about, uh, this very same game, as far as the first 23 moves, have been played a year earlier in a very, very important tournament that both players afterwards said they were familiar with, uh, they were prepared for, they both had um, lines that they had studied and prepared for in this variation. So uh, this game actually was going pretty fast up to 23 when Sergi K um, actually deviated from the game the previous year. So just keep that in mind. A lot of times we talk about you know preparation and going through the openings. Um, but Grandmasters take it a step farther and they actually go you know 23 moves in as far as preparation. So um, not to say that. You know you can't do that, but but that's pretty that's pretty crazy to me to to study that far in advance. But we'll go ahead and continue. Anon plays b6, 
bishop to e7, again trying to develop his pieces and get ready to castle on the king side. And white's going to play queen to d2. Again, both sides, simple development moves all the way up to 10. Both sides looking to castle um, and then really start the fireworks as far as attacking on both sides. From here, black's going to castle on the king side. White's going to castle on the queen side. From here, black's going to continue is what we talked about. He needs to get his knight involved into the game. Knight to d7. Again, he could bring it to knight to c6 if he wanted to. Um, but Anon elects to instead bring it to d7 uh, to really not only uh, protect this pawn on e5, give this outpost to c5, but also he wants to later on either bring a rook to c8. Um, he can also bring a rook to c8 from the the F file, um, but he's really looking to attack and harass this open, this semi-open C file right here. White's going to continue with pawn to G4. If we kind of look at it, um, if we take a step back as far as what both sides' idea are, um, you can see that Black has this backwards pawn here on D6. You have the dark square bishop here from black is closed in. Um, it cannot get out of this chain here. If we look from white's perspective, um, he's castled on the queen side, so he really wants to start pushing forward on the, the king side. Um, you can see his, his knights are not quite as you know, dominant of the center as possibly blacks are here, um, but they are still in a good position. They can, they can get into the game pretty quickly. But really, White's going to start pushing forward with the the pawns here. His his pieces not so much as far as um, you know attacking. There, there's not any semi-open or open files on the king side. So White's ideas are going to be more pushing forward with pawns, um, kind of a pawn attack. While Black's really looking forward. Yes, he can push forward with you know b5. Uh, but more importantly, he's really looking forward to you know opening up the semi-open file and start getting his pieces involved into the game and really attack more with his pieces so uh, just keep in mind both of those ideas as both sides start to progress now again if you're familiar with the Sicilian at all it pretty much just comes down to both sides attacking as fast um, as they can anytime you have sides castling on opposite sides you can't just stay back and play defense uh, because your opponent can just push his entire army on the opposite side of the board up and it, his king will not be more undefended. So uh, just keep that in mind. White just is relentlessly pushing forward and black's going to do the same thing on the opposite side. So the game continues after pawn to g4. Black plays pawn to b5. Again, pushing forward both sides. White's going to just continue marching up the board. Pawn to g5 and black says, you know what? You're going to push forward. I'm going to push forward. See who blinks first. Um, kind of playing a game of cat and mouse here. And after pawn to b4, then white's going to retreat his knight back to e2, and black decides it's time to bring his knight back to e8. Again, both sides, you can already tell, pushing pawns past that 4th and 5th rank, um, there's going to definitely be fireworks. Both sides take the opportunity to solidify their pawn here. So white's going to play pawn to f4, put some solidification on this pawn on g5 I'm not real sure if that's a word and then pawns going to come to a5 from black white's going to continue up the board pushing forward with pawn to f5 um, again you definitely need to be aggressive and black is going to play pawn to a5 a4 from here um, now white has an interesting move from here that he plays so I do want to talk about it because at first glance you may see Kevin, that absolutely makes no sense to me. Um, but instead of taking the bishop here on e6, White actually opts for knight to d4. And if you look at it, and you're like, hey, he just, you know, he's hanging this this knight here on d4. <coughs> Excuse me. But if you look at it, uh, the bishop here on e6 really has nowhere to go. So he is going to get this material back. Um, he's not actually just hanging this knight here on d4. So keep that in mind. Uh, typically, you know, club players, even below, sometimes just see one or two moves in advance. Um, but if, if you really look at it, there is nowhere for this bishop to go. So um, as far as material, this is not a loss for white. Black is going to take this knight here on d4. And then the knight's going to come capture with his knight on d4. And then the bishop here, obviously, he is lost. Um, so... He just accepts that, and he's going to start pushing forward again with his pawn to b3. Again, he can't move this anywhere. It will die. So he decides to continue with his plan and starts to put a lot of pressure on the queen side. As you can see, black is the first side to bring their pawn to the third rank, which is 
pretty quickly, if you look at it, we're only on the 17th move, and Black has already brought his pawn to the third rank. Uh, Black, excuse me, White's going to bring his king to b1, kind of a more secure square. Obviously, he does want to protect this pawn here on a2. And then Black's going to take here on c2, and White's going to recapture with his knight on c2. From here, Black's going to bring his bishop to c3. Again, if you look at it, you would think it's hanging, but the bishop's going to fall anyway. So what he wants to do is he wants to start opening up more files. Obviously, he's completely opened up the c file, which he wants. He now wants to open up this a file. He does have this rook here on a8. He can always swing this over to c8, as we talked about before. Um, but really, if he has the c file and the a file open, it's going to be really hard down the road for white to um, you know, kind of defend both of those. Anytime you can present multiple options as far as attacks on your opponent, two different things that he has to defend, it's usually going to work out for you in the long run. So white for sure, obviously he needs to recapture that material back on b3, and then black's going to play pawn to b3, attacking this knight here on c2. White elects to next play knight to a3. Again, if we look at both sides, kind of what their ideas are now, uh, White really needs to protect this A file. With this C file open and this A file open completely for this rook to get involved in this game, it's going to be really hard for White to hold on. Um, unfortunately, White has to play knight to a3. Now, you've probably heard the saying, knight on the rim is grim. You typically don't want to have your knights on the side of the board, especially in a very, very aggressive game, which any Sicilian game typically is. You definitely don't want to have your pieces defending space or defending material. You typically want them to be more aggressive, to be not only defending but also attacking, more specifically attacking. In this case, this knight here on a3 is going to be more of a defender of space, protecting this a file um, You know, for many attacks from black. He's really not going to be involved into the action that much. So fantastic, in my opinion, move um, from black to open up these files um, and really negate the, the possibility of an attack from this knight here on a3. So if we look from black here, black's ideas are really going to move all his pieces and really attack on the queen side here. And white really has to start to attack on the king side. He's you know started pushing his pawns forward, but he really needs to start eyeing up his rooks, start pushing them down the board get his queen, queen involved into the game, he needs to centralize his queen, um, and he really needs to use these two bishops that he has, he does have the two bishop advantage, um, and really start to attack these long diagonals. So, just some ideas to think about. Black continues with knight to e5, again, very nice central square from black. Um, he can hop into the action at any time, he does have some great um, squares that he can get to. And now white's going to play pawn to h4. Again, as we talked about, white really needs to start pushing forward, um, and that's exactly what he does. Now from here, black is going to continue with rook to a5. Again, for a lot of different reasons, but again, he wants to start putting more pressure on this a file. So he can, now if he wants to bring his queen over to a8, um, he can start to, if he wants to later on, bring his rook over to a8, putting a lot of pressure on this a file. Um, this rook here is protected by the queen here on d8, um, and this rook is also protecting the knight here on e5. Now from here, white played queen to c3, and this is an important move. Actually, um, the, a year later, this is the first deviation from the game played, uh, queen came to a2, which is very different. In this game, uh, the queen actually came to c3. Now, Sergi K, after the game, um, as many grandmasters evaluated this game and asked him kind of where his preparation went in, where he felt like he went wrong, um, he said that this move and the next move were the downfall of the game. I, I would personally agree with him. Who am I to argue with one of the, the strongest chess minds um, you know, out there? But we'll go ahead and get into it as far as, as why this was a problem. The next move from Anand, I think, is probably one of the more brilliant moves in the game. Obviously, we'll get into the most brilliant move here in a second, but it's queen to a8. And this, this again, goes on the idea that we talked about earlier. It's, it's being aggressive um, and still protecting your pieces. So the queen coming to a8 does a couple things. Not only does it attack this pawn here on e4, um, which obviously would gain a tempo by not only capturing but attacking the, queen, the king here on b1, but it's also attacking and defending this rook here on a5. So putting a very, very strong attack on this a file 
while still defending this rook on a1. What this also means is white's going to have to use one of his pieces. Um, since this bishop here on e3 is not moved, it's still blocking the pawn on e4. Um, either the queen's going to have to move and protect this somehow, um, which would be very difficult, or he's going to have to get his bishop involved into the game, which he ends up doing. And this bishop's going to be more of a defender than he will be an attacker later on into the game. Again, white really needed to get his bishops developed attacking the long diagonals. Instead, he was kind of forced to sit back and defend his pieces. His pieces were not active, um, and eventually he just got crushed. So from here, white played bishop to g2, as we talked about before. Now, the next move was actually said to be the best move in the tournament. Now, if you can think about this, these are some of the top players in the entire world, and this next move was thought to be uh, the best move. So if you want to take a minute to pause and see if you can find it, again, really, really think about the ideas that Black has here as far as opening up lines, really attacking on the, the long files, um, getting his major pieces involved into the game. So if you want to pause, it's a fantastic move. Um, take a minute to look at it. But the actual move that was played was knight to c7, and it's it's a fantastic move. And really, what it does is um, it gains a tempo, of, although it does lose material. But it really allows Black to bring all of his pieces, not only control this a file but also this c file, um, and really put a very very strong attack on White. What's interesting is a lot of people ran all these engines as far as Ripka. Um, you know, and all these powerful chess engines, and it took them over an hour to see that this was actually a winning move. Um, Anand said in his preparation, he had kind of looked at it and just kind of thought that it was the best move. Obviously, he probably did some d deep research, but this is a fantastic find, in my opinion. From here, the queen's going to come down, capture on c7. The rook is now going to swing over to c8. Again, the queen's going to have to move, so really really gaining uh, time here as far as attacking but he is losing material he's now going to lose his bishop here on e7 fantastic idea that you can not only give up your knight but your bishop here um, for the sake of time now as we talked about earlier black star square bishop was locked in it was in this this chain here so Anon may have had the idea you know what my bishop is not being used I will gladly give that up if I can have you know, a better uh, development, a stronger attack, more initiative than my opponent. So sometimes if one of your pieces or pawns, um, you know, if you can sacrifice that, if it's not being used and it would not have been used in the, in the first place, you know, think about an idea of giving that material up so your opponent's, you know, pieces or strategy can kind of divert from your idea here. So black continued with knight to c4, um, again putting a lot of pressure, trying to break up this knight here on a3 so we can have this long diagonal. Um, again putting a lot of pressure on this king on b1. He can again move to so many squares. He's also attacking this bishop here on e3, um, definitely, definitely putting a lot of pressure on white. From here, White's going to play pawn to g6. He is up in material, but white really starts to understand that black has a strong attack. It's not enough to just give back material at this point. He really needs to strike a you know, strong attack here. He really doesn't have any pieces eyeing down on the king here. He has the queen here on e7, but the queen can't do it by itself. So he does um, start to push his pawn to g6. Now, black already has a great attack going on over here, but he does need to thwart any ideas that white has. So he's going to capture with his pawn from h7. Uh, keep in mind it would be much different if he captured with his pawn from f7. Um, he no longer has the square on h7 to retreat to. So uh, just keep that in mind. The small little things as, as far as where they capture later on um, really, really make a big difference. So Anand decides to capture with his pawn on g6. Uh, pawn recaptures and then the knight's going to come over and capture on a3. Again, really trying to open up this A file so that this strong attack can come from black later on. Now white is forced to take this material. He is in check right here, so he takes and then black is going to take with A3. Now if you just start to look at it, white has literally no defense in front of him. He has a rook here on H1 that's doing a whole lot of nothing. He has the bishop here on G2. 
defending the pawn on e4, which really is not doing anything. Uh, he does have the bishop on e3, which is not moved from the beginning of the game. He also has the rook here on d1, which is not moved from the beginning of the game since he castled on the queen side. So white really needs to start, try anything uh, to try to attack and save face here. So from here, white's going to play pawn takes on f7, again checking his opponent's king. Black's going to now come to h7, again as we talked about this nice little hideout. And White's going to play knight to f8. He senses and he realizes that he doesn't have much time here. Um, anytime he does not check his opponent, he's pretty much just allowing his opponent um, to check him all over the board and potentially checkmate him. So he plays knight to f8. Um, and Black decides, amazingly enough, to sacrifice his rook on f8. Um, Anon said he calculated enough in advance so that he knew that he did not need this rook um, to checkmate his opponent's king. So he pretty much thwarts that attack. The queen is forced to come to f8, and then black unleashes the rest of the game. A quick checkmate um, that Sergi K resigns right before it finalizes. Uh, but that is rook to a1. This is all forced. The king comes to b2. The rook comes to a2. The king comes to c3. Queen a5 check. King over to d3. Queen b5. After the king comes to d4. Um, rook to a5. Excuse me, a4. King comes back and the queen comes to c4. From here, white resigned um, on the game. What's striking to me is the material disadvantage that black has. Um, he is down two bishops and a rook here. But, as I've talked about so many times and so many people allude to in, in their videos as well, um, it's not about the pieces that you have. It's about the active pieces you have in the fight. As you can see here, actually, uh, white has one very strong active piece in the fight. It's this queen here on f8. He does now have this bishop here on e3, attacking this one square, this diagonal here. Um, but really, his rook here on d D1, his rook on H1, his bishop here on G2 are doing a whole lot of nothing. While queen has, you know, the black queen and the rook here on A5 have a very, very strong attack together. Um, he does also have a pass pawn on, you know, on B3. Just too much to handle um, from a non here. And in this case, as we talked about before, Sergi K was forced to resign. So, Again, we talked about the Knight Dwarf defense. It is a fantastic defense just because it opens up so many doors. You can really be creative. There's so many tactical and sharp lines. Uh, both sides really are going to have fireworks going. Both sides are going to be attacking um, each side. Um, it's really a fun way to express you know, your, your chess ideas. So definitely hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hopefully you're able to take some of the ideas that Anon had, um, that Sergi K may have possibly had. And, and use those in your own game. Again, if you haven't watched the Neither Were Defense video, definitely check that out. Hopefully you guys enjoyed uh, the more famous games videos. Let me know if there's a particular one you want me to watch and make a video on, or if you just want me to make more videos altogether for famous games. So um, hopefully you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.